Hi, this is Misha, and we've already done a video on the early smokeless powder guns, and we've done a video on the development of the self-loading rifle, and we've even done one on the evolution of the submachine gun. So it only seemed fitting that we look at the evolution, the development of the assault rifle, and by that I, I am using the term correctly, at true assault rifle. Essentially, what makes an assault rifle is a weapon that is select fire. It is primarily an infantry rifle. It is not a primarily a machine gun, meaning it is built to be fired in single shot. However, it has the capability of being select fire. And it fires an intermediate power cartridge. Now, usually an assault rifle will have a fixed barrel, and they will be made as basically economically as possible for mass issuance. They're not typically specialist weapons. They also feed from detachable magazines most of the time. Again, we're getting into generalized definitions, so one can argue. So I've laid out examples of pretty much from the beginning of the assault rifle through the modern day. There's been several variations and generations over the years. So we'll just jump in. On our first one, oh and sorry I didn't bring the mags up for these guys. I was late and I didn't have a lot of spare time plus the couch is already overly crowded so forgive me for that. Really all of these are going to be feeding from double stack magazines of 20 or 30 rounds. Sometimes you have some outliers but yeah. The first gun up is a gun that was almost an assault rifle. This is of course an M1 carbine, although I have this one set up to be similar to an M2. The M2 was the select fire, this is a dummy selector guys, it was a select fire version of the M1. It had a stronger stock, at least most of the later M2s did. It was select fire, it had a stronger mag catch, and that was for use with extended 30 round mags. Most were also fitted with a uh, recoil check, a stabilizer, a muzzle brake. Now the M2 did not actually go into service at all and it was usually by conversion kits until 1944-1945 and they saw heavy use in Korea. However, when the project was get, getting going in 1939-1940, originally the M1 carbine was supposed to be select fire. It was only towards the end, as war was looming, they dropped the automatic capability feature. This is also why it was very easy to convert M1s to M2s, and they basically were just dropping conversion parts. So it was intended to be a select fire, and really would have been. It has a short barrel of 18 inches, which is towards what an assault rifle should be. We're a lightweight gun. This is a gas piston, a tappet system. It's a sh sh I have an operat here being kicked back by a small piston. We have a rotating barrel. Excuse me, guys, like I said, long day. We have a rotating bolt. Quite similar to an M1 Garand's, but much smaller. So we were almost there. What really held the M1, M2 back from being a true assault rifle is its cartridge. It fired 30 caliber carbine. 7.62 by 33 millimeter. This is officially considered a pistol cartridge, although it is much, you know, longer and larger with better range and accuracy than most pistol cartridges out there. So you can debate the semantics of it, but no one really considers the M2 assault rifle, but it was very close. Are there early possibilities? Would be the Russian model 18, excuse me, 1916 Fedorov which was a select fire weapon made in small numbers in World War I and after World War I. It was supposed to be chambered for a proprietary 6.5 millimeter intermediate style cartridge, but once it went into production when World War I kicked off, it was uh, hastily converted just to fire 6.5 by 50, which was an Arasaka round. And even though it's considered a full power cartridge, it's still on the milder end. So there was that idea 
of an intermediate round, possibly a smaller cartridge, lighter recoil, as early as the Fedorov. There was also the Russian AVS-36, which was select fire, but it very definitely fired a full power cartridge. And there are other guns that did as well, which really takes them out of the range of uh, being an assault rifle because of their weight. Plus, none of them were very effective because full power cartridges are just too much for an infantry shoulder fired gun. You really need a smaller cartridge. The M2 is actually quite nice and controllable. Obviously, the one that everyone thinks of as the first assault rifle is the German sling messed around. There we go. <laughs> the German and this has had many names. It began as the MKB 42 then was the MP 43 then the MP 44 and then as we know it today the STG 44 the Sturmgewehr which does mean storm or assault rifle. This fires an 8 millimeter, 8 by 33 curves. So we have a casing length very similar to one carbine, but we have a heavier bullet with more powder behind it. So we get a little more range, a little more penetration. This is why it's considered an assault rifle. It has a selector here, right here. For semi or full auto, we have a separate safety here. We have a pistol grip, which is not required to be an assault rifle, although it's a very common feature. We have a typical wooden shoulder stock. This feeds from 30 round magazines with a button type mag catch. We have a 16 inch barrel, so we're a little shorter, but this is pretty heavy. It uh, is made from steel and wood. It is made from stamped steel. This is one of the early pioneers of the stamped steel gun. It came after the MP38 and MP40. And really, whereas the M1 carbine was a scaled down Garand, the MP44 was really a scaled up submachine gun. You can tell where the submachine gun had inspired this. Which isn't surprising considering the MP18 was German and really the first successful submachine gun, then the MP28 and so on and so forth. So you can see where this version of the assault rifle grew out of a submachine gun. Germany was also developing the, uh, the G43 around the same time, which was a full power but semi only rifle and it really did not go much of anywhere. This was obviously the future. Unfortunately, well, fortunately for us, but, you know, just, you know, being whatever, this did not enter into large, wide-scale production until very late in the war, and they never could make enough of them, and they had problems with magazine shortages and so on and so forth. But it did pioneer the whole stamped receiver. This is a long-stroke piston, so the piston's connected to the carrier. We have a tilting or tipping bolt. Basically when the carrier comes back it grabs the bolt and pulls it out of a notch and back. The recoil return spring is actually in the buttstock similar to how you might see on a submachine gun. So it's a big coil spring that just pulls off, the stock just pulls off in a style that many will be considered uh, common with today. Typical trigger typical adjustable sights. We have a stamped steel handguard, stacking rod, and we have a threaded barrel with a protected front sight. While MP44 production ended with World War II, they were able to make hundreds of thousands of them, nearly half a million, and so these would appear in service in various nations, especially in Eastern Europe, in the late 40s and 50s and have even popped up in the 21st century in small numbers here and there. So while production was short, their influence was very wide. After World War II, there were a lot of plans and designs 
but most never got off the drawing board or prototype stage. This was because post-World War II, the war was over, obviously. Military funding was being cut in most nations. Most nations were interested in rebuilding. And that's where the Kalashnikov here, of course, kind of comes from. We have a video comparing the Sturmgewehr and the Kalashnikov, so I'm not going to go into that too much today in this one. But I will say that work began in Russia on an intermediate cartridge in 1942, and by late 1943, they had adopted 7.62 M43, which was 7.62 by 41. After creating the cartridge itself, which was essentially a, a cut-off, shorter version of 7.62 54R, and then also having a rimless case, they wanted to have a rifle, a bolt-action rifle, a self-loading carbine, a light machine gun, and a select-fire infantry rifle chambered for it. Of these, the Kalashnikov was the most successful. The bolt action never went anywhere. The self-loading carbine became the SKS, and the uh, light machine gun became the RPD. However, though work began in 1944, 1945 on the Kalashnikov, war ended, and it was put on the back burner until late 46 with some prototypes, and then the, the final prototype version was made in 47, it was tested in 48, and was finally adopted and put into production in 49. The first ones were made of stamped steel receivers, a completely different style of stamping, but the same concept as the MP44. Then they would switch back to milled receivers as they'd been using on the Mosin and SKS because it was easier for them to produce at the time. This gun uses a long stroke piston like the MP44, but it uses a rotating bolt like that M1 Carbine or M1 Grand. The trigger group is also very M1 Carbine, M1 Grandish. We have a 16 inch barrel, threaded, gas systems up here, wood furniture. This is quite a heavy gun, although by the standards of the late 40s, it was a little bit lighter than a lot of infantry rifles of the day. And as with the, uh, the first two we looked at, this fed from a detachable 30 round magazine. The AK's importance to military history cannot be overstated. Millions upon millions have been produced. No one even knows how many. A hundred million? More? Not only did Soviet Russia make a ton, they exported the license to make them to places like China, Poland, Hungary, Romania, Egypt. And you had other places making unlicensed copies, such as in sometimes in India, the Khyber Pass guns, and to some extent the Israeli Galil even. Also, there's the Finnish Valmet, which is its own kind of in-between status, but you get the idea. The AK really checked all the boxes for an assault rifle. It was quite compact. It was relatively inexpensive to produce. Select fire. Single. Full auto would be in the middle. Safe. It fired a true intermediate cartridge. Very easily man portable. And it was really among the very first to be successful and produced in large numbers for a wide range of variations, models, and a time period. Whereas the MP44 was in and out of production after only a couple of years, and even the M1 Carbine was only produced for about four years, although in service much longer. But we have a lot of videos on the AK, so I don't want to harp on it here. What I will move to is perhaps the second most prolific rifle after World War II, the FNFAL. This is an Israeli variant, and I picked it to bring out because Israel was a very early adopter in 1955, so their version of the FAL is, is quite, uh, has a lot of early features. Now, this is select fire normally, although most of the Israeli infantry versions were restricted to semi-only because of the selector. 
So you'll see FALs issued as either just semi-auto only rifles or select fire. And this is because while technically it might, it fires an intermediate cartridge, not really. After World War II, Britain was really working on the, the 280 round, which would have been a true intermediate, although still kind of on the larger end, cartridge. And the FAL was initially going to be chambered for it. America, however, had what it called the 30 caliber light rifle cartridge. And it insisted, more or less, that the NATO standardization should be around its 30 caliber light rifle cartridge. And it intimated, although it never said on paper, that if this change was made to the FAL, if it was adapted for the 30 caliber light rifle, it would select the FAL, and therefore NATO could have a standard issue rifle. Well, the problem is 30 caliber light is really nothing more than 30-06 that's been scaled down just a little bit. 30-06 is 7.62 by 63. And the light rifle cartridge, which is known as 308 commercially, was 7.62 by 51. So they did shave about a half inch off the casing. However, we still have a large 30 caliber bullet with a lot of powder behind it. It wasn't a true intermediate cartridge like 7.62-39 was. Just to go back for a second, on the AKs, the original cartridge was called 7.62-41. They would do some minor alterations in late 45, early 46, and it would be turned into 7.62-39, although they never changed the cartridge designation, as it were. So, just minor tweaking to it. Anyway, <clears throat> because of this, Many don't call a rifle like the FAL an assault rifle, although it fits into that kind of category. They like to call it a battle rifle. It's more like, you know, an M1 Grand or G43 or SVT40 that you normally has select fire capability and feeds from the detachable magazine. But the FAL was analogous to the AK in the 50s. It was a milled receiver. We have a short stroke gas piston system. We have a tilting or tipping bolt. We have a 21 inch barrel. Now there's a lot of FAL variations and we have several videos on the FAL so I'm not really going to go into that now. But this was a very common rifle throughout NATO. Not only was it used by Israel, it was used by Britain, Canada, Australia, Austria, West Germany, for a brief time, but it was. And it would proliferate throughout South America, where it was made by Imbel and used by Brazil. It was also made and used in Argentina. It would get into South America, where it was used quite a bit, and it was manufactured in South Africa. And so it really got around. It was produced without license in India. They really like doing that. So the FAL is extremely important and next to the AK saw the most use in the 50s and 60s. Even though really fired a cartridge that was too powerful to be used in an assault rifle. We still have the whole machine receiver and wood combination going on though. These would commonly be issued with uh, 20 round mags, by the way, although 30s do exist. The biggest competition to the FAL was the German, West German, G3. Now this is actually a Spanish set me, and we're starting here because this gun has a very interesting history. We have the MP44, which obviously was pretty much finalized in 43, 44. After that, workers at Mauser developed the STG45M, which instead of using a gas operating system, used a roller delayed blowback, which was a basically emulated the effects of a locked breech without actually having a true locked breech. It was based on a stamped receiver like the MP44, and it 
was much cheaper and faster to produce. And it was going to be an 8mm Curse. Well, the war ended, but the designers ended up in France and Spain. Now, their work in France didn't really go much of anywhere aside from some prototypes. They did work with some guns in 30 caliber carbine, 8mm Curse, so on and so forth. But in Spain, the factory, the design team at Setme was established, and they came up with this rifle here. It started to appear in prototype form in 55, 56, and the original Model A's were in 56. Then there was the Model B, and eventually the Model C, which this is based on. The C's wouldn't appear until 64, but they were just the same as Model B's from 58, with a few changes. Originally, the designers of the Setme saw the problem with the 30 light rifle cartridge, 762 NATO as it became known. They knew it was too powerful for full auto. So they would download it to be 7.62 by 51 Setme, which was the same, obviously, dimensions, just a, a lighter recoil, which was better for full auto fire. That was the Model A and in getting into the Model B, but by the Model C, we're only firing 762 NATO, and the Model B could fire it as well with some parts changed out. So they tried, they knew there was an issue, but they needed to standardize. This is based on the STG45M. We have the roller lock system. We do not have a gas system, as it were. This is just a caulking tube up here. We have wood furniture. We have a stamped and welded receiver. We have a barrel that's just a smidge under 18 inches. We have a flash hider on it in typical style here. This is one of the first to really appear with a true flash hider. It can also launch rifle grenades, which some FALs could. I picked this one because it has the wood furniture. East, uh, excuse me, West Germany would use the FAL as the G1 for a very brief period of time, but they would have very quickly switch over to a licensed produced version of the SETME Model B, known as the G3. And HK would work with SETME to improve it. And so the G3 was born of the SETME. Now the early G3s would look very similar to this. They wouldn't have this paddle rear sight because that's a Model C feature. They would have a more of a Mauser rifle style sight up here. But, in other ways, they would have the wood furniture and so on. As time would go on, they would transition over to polymers and folding stocks, collapsing stocks, and things like that. These would typically feed from 20-round magazines, first made of steel. Later, they would switch to aluminum to save on weight. They were usually 20 rounds, but there would be 30s made as well. And this was the biggest challenger to the FAL in the West. HK would be producing these through the 80s and 90s as the G3 moving all the way through A1, A2, A3, A4. And they would also issue licenses to other factories such as in Greece. But again, we have a rifle that's really firing a cartridge too powerful, but it fits in that assault rifle vein and we are on a stamped receiver. These were quite inexpensive to produce for the time and um, really show progress from the MP44, whereas something like the FAL is still built on a milled receiver. So this would be kind of the second choice. You don't see a lot of European nations necessarily going with the G3, but you see a lot of uh, other nations going with it. And as time would go on, more and more would. So what about America? Well, they did not honor their semi-commitment to adopt the FAL. After the 30 caliber light rifle cartridge became 7.62 NATO, America did try out a version of the FAL as the T-48, but they tried it up against an updated version of what was essentially the M1 Grand as the T-44. In the end, they selected the American-designed gun. Now, we have a history on this, so I'm not going to get into the politics here. But let's just say America won its own way. We're still using 7.62 NATO, but we have essentially an updated Garand. It feeds from detachable 20-round mags. These could be select fire, although 
This is, of course, a semi-only. I have a fake lock out here because most of the military guns were restricted to semi-only as well. This gun, the FAL and the G3 were pretty uncontrollable in full auto, but with, you know, a good grip and some training, you could really kind of at least get halfway decent at it. The M14 wasn't. There's no pistol grip. It's a pretty light gun. The balance is kind of front in the front. This gun was absolutely uncontrollable in full auto, except for maybe by a handful of true trained experts. So they restricted these to semi. We're still using a short gas piston tapping an op rod. We still have a rotating bolt is on a grand. They shortened the barrel, but then they added a long flash hider bayonet mount. So the barrel length is really about the same as on a grand. We are a little bit lighter weight because we've cut the gas system down. It doesn't come all the way out and we've cut the handguard. So it is lighter weight than a grand, but lengthwise it's about the same. This was adopted in 1957 too, and didn't really start to go into service until the late 50s, early 60s, with the last orders being fulfilled in the mid 60s. It was incredibly obsolete and dated by its time. You don't see anyone else making an assault and or battle rifle of this style. We still have a machined receiver, wood furniture. This assembly is quite convoluted. These are relatively expensive to produce. We have very finely adjustable sights. And again, this full auto is not really a possibility. About the only thing that the M14 had going for it was tradition and familiarity. Springfield Arsenal did try to tell the government they could save money by producing these because they already had tooling for the Grand that they could adapt to make these. In reality, that was a false bill of sale. Most all of the tooling had to be replaced anyway. Because of all these reasons, the M14 was not adopted by really anyone outside of America. I mean, you had a few Asian nations that used them, but it was just, it was America's own thing. A few other nations did their own thing as well. For example, Italy did the BM-59, which is an updated grand to fire 7.62 NATO as well, and we have a video comparing that to this. France would stick with its MAS model 1949 and 1949-56. Switzerland would keep on using its PE-57, which is a true full-power gun. And Japan would go with the Type 64, which is an interesting critter. Uh, it's a distinctive design, and it does use a lower power version of 7.62 NATO, not dissimilar to 7.62 SETME. So there were some outliers amongst the NATO members and other pieces, people in the world, but the majority of people by the early 60s would be using one of these rifles we looked at, be it an AK variant, an FAL, a G3 SETME, or a few unfortunate souls, the M14. <laughs> so th these were the rifles that were dominating by the time of the Vietnam War. And you see very, very few true self-loading only rifles still in use. Things like the Grand and SVT-40 are coming out of service. Britain would adopt a version of the FAL called the L1A1, which was semi-only. Same situation with all these others like the Israeli. As much as America was behind the times with the M14, and for that matter, 7.62 NATO, the next major step forward was way ahead of time. Do, 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 do. Obviously, any American knows this gun here. And it'll represent pretty much the whole group of uh, AR-15s. This is an early SP-1, so it has, I picked it because it has a lot of the earlier features. Now, keep in mind, the all the work on the M14 and the cartridge was pretty much done by the government at government arsenals and all that. The AR-15 was an outgrowth of Armorlite, who was a private company. 
as was its round, at that time just known as 223 Remington. It was based on 222, which was more of a hunting round, and it was modified a bit to be more of a military round. These would begin with the AR-10. The idea with the AR-10 was it had alloy receiver, synthetic furniture, no wood, no as, as, as few machined parts as possible. They were trying to make a gun as inexpensively as they could while maintaining quality, but they were really more concerned with weight and size. And they were trying to use new materials and techniques learned from the aircraft industry. So this is where Eugene Stoner and his team came up with the AR-10. Now since 7.62 NATO was at the time the current cartridge that the U.S. government wanted to go with, in the mid to late 50s this is what the AR-10 was built for. And the U.S. government would try it out, but it never really had a, a shot. The only other gun that was challenging the, uh, the T-44 was, of course, the T-48, the FAL. And even it didn't stand much of a chance. The AR-10 Armor Light would shop around a bit, and many governments and nations would try it out in their, in their testing, but very few would adopt it. Very few were actually sold. This led to the AR-15, though, which was really a much better fit. We're firing 223, which is 5.56 by 45, today known as NATO. This is, again, a true intermediate cartridge. And it's even a small diameter, high velocity intermediate cartridge. So this was a clear step up, clear improvement over something like 8mm curves or 7.62x39. Over 7.62 NATO we have more controllability and full, full automatic. We actually have a gun you can use in full auto and a soldier can carry many more rounds for the same weight. So it actually makes it an effective assault rifle. The gun itself, even though it has much less recoil, is made from synthetic materials. We have synthetic, kind of feels like Bakelite, although it's not, it's just an early synthetic fiberglass type stuff. We have aluminum upper and lower forge type receivers. We have a pencil profile, thin profile, steel barrel, 20 inches. This has the earlier three prong flash hider. The gas system is unique, it is a nearly true, not exactly true, direct impingement. You can argue that there is a piston, but it's on the bolt. Either way, most people call these direct impingement, and they are. I mean, you have a gas tube uh, siphoning gas off the barrel and pushing it against a key on the uh, carrier. This saves on weight and complexity. We have a simple rotating bolt, as most are all aware of but it is a multi-lug rotating bolt. We're not using the old two-lug style from the Grand or that the AK copied. Now interestingly, we have a recoil spring in the buttstock, not dissimilar to that on the MP44. And of course the AR-10 had this as well. And we have a dust cover, not too much unlike on an MP44. And the mag release is similar to on an MP44. It's an actual push button, not a paddle style. Which is a pretty uncommon feature, but a good one for that day. We have a very ergonomic and easy to use selector. And of course, there's a huge history on the AR-15. Armalite would sell the design to Colt in December of 1959. Colt would begin producing it in a select fire version. They would sell some to the government, and the, especially the Air Force, early on in the 60s. Some police departments would pick it up as well, but not a huge number. The SP-1, a dedicated semi-auto version, would appear in 1964. And of course, it would eventually be adopted by the U.S. military as standard issue as the M16A1 in 1967. 
And this really was a huge step forward from the M14 and also the G3 set me and FAL. And you could argue from the Kalashnikov as well that there, there's some debate there. There's pros and cons to both. But it really gave the infantry soldier a lightweight weapon and good firepower. Now this was the right gun for a war like Vietnam, close in jungle warfare. And because we have a 20 inch barrel and the sights are well spaced out and these are actually quite good sights, accuracy was very acceptable. Seven, uh, 223, well again, this is a very common gun that most of you probably know more about than I do, but you can't do a history of the assault rifle without mentioning the early AR-10 and AR-15 because this really kicked people out of that 1940s, 1950s mindset into the what we're really doing today.